nightly business report. Good evening. Tonight, Sri Lanka and India reaffirm their commitment to strengthening bilateral ties with increased business cooperation. Revenue from tourism rises to $154 million, a strong 54% increase from last year's statistics. A positive start to the week as Colombo Bourse closes in the green. However, IMF board talks caused some slightly shaky predictions. And Unilever keeps to their sustainable business goals with a brand new solar power upgrade. From Studio 24, here's Sina Mayadune. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The Indo Lanka Chamber of Commerce and Industry has said Sri Lankan businesses have a lot to learn and gain from India. The president of ILCCI said this is a golden opportunity to integrate our economies and Sri Lanka has much to gain from India, continuing that as a business, they should be pushing them for the ECTA in order to penetrate the market. The Indo Lanka Chamber of Commerce and Industry hosted a captivating evening interactive session with H. E. Santos Jha, High Commissioner of India to Sri Lanka, at Taj Samudra Colombo. The event brought together business leaders and industry experts for a night of engaging discussions and networking. The event commenced with a warm welcome address by the President of the ILCCI, Mr. Raghu Amaran. The highlight of the event was a fireside chat featuring High Commissioner Santos Jha and Mr. Wish Govindasamy, immediate past chairman of Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, past president of ILCCI and deputy chairman of Sunshine Holdings. The discussion was skillfully moderated by Mr. Romesh David, immediate past president of ILCCI and CEO of South Asia Gateway Terminals. The meeting comes with Sri Lanka and India agreeing to bolster ties and reaffirm bilateral commitments moving forward. Sri Lanka's remittances coming through official channels gained 13.5% to $544.4 million in May 2024 compared to the same month last year, helped by more expatriates using the official banking channels. The remittances in the first five months were $2,624.4 million, 11.8% up from the same period last year. The remittances have risen continuously after the central bank gave up a parallel exchange rate regime which compelled most expatriates to switch informal undial and hawala money transfer methods. Sri Lanka witnessed a 57% jump in remittances coming through formal banking channels to $5.97 billion in 2023 from $3.8 billion a year earlier helped by elimination of parallel exchange rates. Sri Lanka's external sector has now recovered after the central bank started to run balance of payment surpluses following a decision to end money printing to sterilize interventions made with Indian Asian clearing union money. Official data now shows the Sri Lanka Port Authority has made profits of 40.3 billion rupees in 2023 before payment to the Treasury of 8.6 billion rupees to repay a loan taken to build Hambantata Port, down from 57.0 billion rupees. The SLPA paid income tax of 5.6 billion rupees, down from 13.2 billion rupees a year earlier. The Treasury had also reduced the approved cadre of the SLPA. The statement said that after a lengthy analysis by considering the technological advancement over the years and redundant job categories, the General Treasury revised the cadre of the SLPA in 2023 and reduced the cadre by 3,003 from 9,990 to 6,987. According to the report, total revenues fell to 83.7 billion rupees in 2023 from 90.9 billion rupees in 2022, with charges also cut to compete with other terminals in the port. Port facilities' charges were also lower due to import restrictions compared to earlier years. Other income was reported as 19.9 billion rupees, down from 22.54 billion rupees, though other income was not specified. The Ports Authority receives fees from private container terminals. SLPA also reported finance income of 5.3 billion rupees in 2023, down from 5.6 billion in 2022. The SLPA has paid a levy of 8.67 billion rupees to the Consolidated Fund in 2023. 
State Minister of Finance, Ranjit Siembala Pitiya, announced that the government is progressively implementing measures to develop and regularize tax revenue collection through its various revenue departments. Speaking during the parliamentary debate on the Public Debate Management Act, Siembala Pitiya highlighted the role of the Parliamentary Committee on Ways and Means in overseeing the country's financial affairs. The State Minister emphasized that this oversight has been instrumental in supporting policy changes and improving revenue collection strategies. CM Balapitia noted that the Inland Revenue Department is already leveraging new recommendations to streamline taxpayer registration processes and enhance the recovery of outstanding taxes. He mentioned that while the department is working within the existing legal framework, efforts are underway to amend laws to better reflect current needs and remove any legal obstacles hindering efficient tax collection. Sri Lanka's foreign exchange revenue from tourism rose to $154 million in May 2024, a 54% jump from the last year, while the arrivals also gained 34% in the month compared to 2023, the central bank said, quoting tourism promotion authorities. Sri Lanka's tourist arrivals went up to 896,779 persons in the first five months of 2024, a 71% jump compared to the same period last year. May arrivals were up to 112,128. Tourism earnings in May were estimated at $154 million, up from $100 million a year ago. Tourist arrivals and revenue from tourism were expected to slow down after a new on-arrival visa system through VFS Global. After the new system, foreign visitors who were earlier per Permitted to obtain a visa free of charge are compelled to pay $21.61 of a fee to VFS Global. Sri Lanka's leisure industry has protested the complex website which is putting off some users as well as higher fees. Tourism has helped Sri Lanka to see an inflow of $1,405.6 million in the first five months of the year, 87% higher than in the same period in 2023. Sri Lanka has been elected by the United Nations General Assembly to the United Nations Economic and Social Council at the elections held in New York for a three-year term commencing on the 1st of January 2025. As a member of the ECOSOC, Sri Lanka will contribute to the Council's efforts and programs which include eradication of poverty, food security, financing or development, reform of the international financial architecture to better support vulnerable countries, climate justice, gender equality and women's empowerment, rights of persons with disabilities, science and technology and bridging the digital divide. The 18 countries that were elected to the 54 member states of ECOSOC include Uzbekistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Saudi Arabia from the Asia-Pacific region. The election to the ECOSOC is Sri Lanka's fourth consecutive success at a multilateral election. This marks a significant milestone for Sri Lanka's diplomatic engagement led by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and its overseas diplomatic missions. Established in 1945 by the Charter of the United Nations, the ECOSOC is one of the six principal organs of the UN and serves as a central platform within the UN system to coordinate the economic and social fields, advance international cooperation and development, as well as matters relating to the Sustainable Development Goals. The permanent mission of Sri Lanka to the United Nations in New York in coordination with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Sri Lanka missions overseas spearheaded the election campaign. Sri Lankan High Commissioner to the UK, Rohit Bogo Lagama, says that many investors in the UK are looking at a seamless process when investing and that Sri Lanka should move towards such an updated system. The High Commissioner is of the view that this would help boost Sri Lanka's foreign direct investment and it would be easier to sell Sri Lanka as an investment destination. I have been uh, able to get across to the, the main uh, players that counts to bring us the investments. And in this regard, even on the 13th, why I'm here on a very short visit, is uh, Dr. Selva Pankaj of Regent University. He's coming to Kanambu with a proposal and for materialization of the proposal for what you term as an education platform to access all the universities in the digital form for our students here in Sri Lanka. We also have gone in for the mineral industry and we have signed up to the agreements for them to get now mobilized in Sri Lanka in the eastern part of our country. We also, that is what we call capital metals are coming into the country mm -hmm. and uh, that process is now 
gone into the final stages of implementation, which I should see, we can see the operations taken off very soon. Then in the capital markets, major drive is taking place in the educational sphere, in the medical section. We are also having the collaborative effect of our top specialists from the United Kingdom joining hands with the medical profession over in Sri Lanka. Let's take a short commercial break. This is the Nile Business Report. Welcome back to the Nile Business Report. The stock market closed in the green today as both ASPI and S&P SL20 recorded gains at the end of today's trading session, kicking off the week in a positive trajectory. For more on this, we have Kanushka Jayathissa from SC Securities. Yes. In today's market, the All Share Price Index closed at 12,401 points, marking a 87 points increase, while the S&P SL20 ended at 3,690 points showing an increase of 35 points from the previous session. Total trading volume reached 63 million shares with a turnover of 1.6 billion rupees. The top gainers for the day were Blue Diamonds Jewelry Non-Voting, Standard Capital and Nations Trust Bank Non-Voting. Top losers for the day were Nations Lanka Finance, Malwatha Plantations Non-Voting and Udupus Seller Plantations. Moving on, Nations Lanka Finance, Browns Investments and LOLC Finance recorded the highest share volumes while the John Keynes Holdings, Haley's and Hatton National Bank led in turnovers. The only crossing recorded for the day included 1.2 million shares of John Keels Holdings for 253 million rupees. The stock market started off with positive strides this week. However, there is room for latency as the IMF review looms closer. For a forecast of this week's trading, let's connect with Dimanth Matthews from First Capital Holdings. So this week is a deciding week where the decision of the IMF is pending uh, on the 12th of uh, June uh, with the meeting uh, take, taking place and uh, the market is so far taking it uh, positively and uh, the start of the week we saw the market ending in uh, positive territory however as the week uh, moves on uh, we think uh, there could be a bit of a, a slowdown in uh, turnover especially on the retail front uh, because of a wait and see approach with uh, some of the investors however uh, corporate side and high net worth we think activity may uh, continue so the index might be uh, onto the positive territory and uh, on the with the decision uh, if it is uh, positive we are expecting a very strong buying interest uh, in the market and it is likely to be led by the uh, banking sector and uh, with it uh, again uh, if uh, there is any kind of delay uh, on the IMF front uh, there could be again uh, somewhat of a negative territory however so far uh, what we are seeing is that investors are uh, quite positive however uh, they wanted to uh, actually see the decision so uh, with that uh, there will be uh, some amount of uh, speculation and some uh, amount of a uh, wait and see approach so uh, with that once the decision is uh, comes uh, uh, there will be strong activity uh, coming back uh, into the market Gold prices moved in a flat to low range in Asian trade today, nursing steep losses from last week as fears of high U.S. interest rates mounted before a Federal Reserve meeting and key inflation data due this week. Spot gold rose 0.1% to $2,295.7 an ounce, while gold futures expiring in August fell 0.6% to $2,313.30 an ounce. The yellow metal had tumbled from near record highs last week after non-farm payrolls data read much higher than expected, which caused traders to rethink expectations for a September rate cut. 
Oil prices rose slightly in Asian trade today, steadying after three straight weeks of losses as traders awaited more cues on U.S. interest rates and the OPEC deal later this week. Brent oil futures expiring in August rose 0.2 percent to $79.77 a barrel, while West Texas intermediate crude futures rose 0.2 percent to $75.38 a barrel. Crude had fallen last week as a rebound from four-month lows was stalled by a stronger dollar. The greenback surged on stronger-than-expected non-farm payrolls data. The Sri Lankan rupee remains steady against the U.S. dollar today compared to last week. According to the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, the buying rate of the U.S. dollar is 297 rupees and 93 cents. Meanwhile, the selling rate of the U.S. dollar is 307.52 rupees. Now let's observe how the rupee behaved against the other global currencies. Short commercial break. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Fitch Ratings has assigned commercial banks proposed debentures of up to 20 billion rupees, a national long-term rating of triple B+, a rating two notches below the bank's national long-term rating anchor. According to Fitch's statement, this reflects the baseline notching for loss severity for this type of debt and expectation of poor recoveries. There is no additional notching for non-performance risk as the notes do not incorporate going concern loss absorption option features. The final rating is the same as the expected rating assigned on the 15th of February 2024 and follows the receipt of documents conforming to information already received. The proposed debentures will mature in 5, 7 and 10 years and will be listed on the Colombo Stock Exchange. Commercial Bank plans to use the proceeds to further strengthen its Tier 2 capital base, reduce maturity mismatches in the balance sheet and support loan growth. The bank expects the proposed debentures to qualify as Base 3 compliant regulatory Tier 2 capital. The debentures include a non-viability clause whereby they convert to ordinary voting shares upon the occurrence of a trigger event as determined by the Monetary Board of Sri Lanka. Commercial Bank Sri Lankan Rupee denominated subordinated debt is rated two notches below the bank's national long-term rating anchor. Commercial Bank Sri Lankan Rupee denominated subordinated debt is rated two notches below the bank's national long-term rating anchor. Unilever Sri Lanka recently integrated a new 2.33 megawatt solar power project at its Horana factory, partnering with Abans Electricals PLC for project execution. This significant step forward is Unilever's commitment to sustainability and renewable energy represents a total investment of 1.3 million euros. The project aligns with Unilever's global climate transition action plan and contributes to the ambitious goals set by the Sri Lanka. Ministry of Electricity and Energy for transitioning the country's electricity supply to renewable sources by 2030. Ali Tariq, chairman and CEO of Unilever Sri Lanka, said they are proud to inaugurate the solar power project, yet another investment to protecting the environment through sustainable practices. It's not just about manufacturing quality products and brands, they also ensure that they act as responsible corporate citizens in everything they do, aligning with their global vision of making sustainable living commonplace. The investment will produce 30 to 35 percent of the Horana factory's energy requirement. The project is expected to reduce Unilever's carbon footprint by curbing carbon emissions by a remarkable 2,090 metric tons per annum, which is equivalent to the environmental impact of planting over 48,000 trees. Unilever Sri Lanka is a leading manufacturer and distributor of fast-moving consumer goods with a portfolio of 30 popular brands serving millions of Sri Lankans every day. Unilever aims to achieve net zero emissions by 2039. From 2024 onwards, climate change, nature conservation, plastic reduction 
and supporting livelihoods have been identified as the cornerstones of Unilever's sustainability agenda, underpinning its commitment to responsible business practices. Noble Biocare, a global leader in innovative implant-based dental restorations, announced its launch in Sri Lanka. This marks the first time the prestigious brand, renowned for its rich history and deep clinical expertise, will be available in our dynamic market. As a pioneer in implantology, Nobel Biocare is excited to be the first major dental brand to enter the Sri Lankan market, bringing with it a legacy of excellence and innovation. Delmage Healthcare is a multi-modality healthcare provider in Sri Lanka with a large distribution network and a highly trained group of professionals dedicated to delivering superlative after-sales and customer service to its valued clientele. Nobel Biocare will exclusively partner with Delmage Healthcare to distribute its products in the local market, having recognized its strengths. Pierre May Barthwal, General Manager of Investa India and South Asia, shared that they are excited to introduce Nobel Biocare to Sri Lanka. Built over 65 years of continuous innovation, the goal at Nobel Biocare is to empower dental professionals to give the quality of life back to their patients. Adrian Shockman, CEO of Delmage Healthcare, had this to say on the partnership, saying they are indeed happy to forge a powerful partnership with such an esteemed company such as Nobel Biocare, which will certainly enhance their global image and brand acceptance. In collaboration with its Sri Lankan distribution partner, Delmage Healthcare, Nobel Biocare will ensure the availability of cutting-edge products and the execution of all local events. This partnership will facilitate the seamless introduction of new products to the Sri Lankan market, meeting the evolving needs of dental products professionals and their patients. Adani Group plans to invest over $1 billion in setting up projects in Sri Lanka to generate electricity from wind in what would be the island nation's single largest foreign direct investment and the biggest ever power project. Group firm Adani Green Energy Limited will set up two wind farms in Sri Lanka's Mana town and Poonirin village in the northern province with a total installed capacity of 484 megawatt at an investment of about $740 million. The related infrastructure that would transmit electricity to consumption centres will see further investment of over $290 million. The project will not just be Sri Lanka's largest renewable energy project but also the nation's biggest power project to date. Last month, Sri Lanka had entered into an agreement to buy electricity from Adani's wind power stations for 20 years. Adani Group is also involved in building a $700 million terminal project at Sri Lanka's largest port in Colombo. Let's take a short commercial break. This is the Nile Business Report. Back to the Daily Business Report. Asian stocks were a mixed bag today, with Japanese markets rising on a slightly positive revision in gross domestic product data, while other Asian markets sank on resurgent concerns over US interest rates. Futures for India's Nifty 50 index pointed to a positive open, broader Asian markets retreated, with South Korea's Kospi losing 0.7%, while Philippines' shares lost about 1%. Japan's Nikkei 225 index rose 0.7%, as did the broader topics index. Hong Kong's Hang Seng index declined 0.6% to 18,367, 0.73, and the Shanghai Composite Index was down 0.4% to 3,036, 0.08. Australia's S&P ASX 200 climbed 0.4% to 7,853, 0.40. Risk sentiment was also somewhat hit by the European Union elections, which showed a broader shift towards right-wing and far-right parties. Well, that concludes today's daily business report. We'll see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings around the business globe. Until then, I'm Sinamaya Dene and have a good night.